talk today about uh, a kind of strange path from uh, engineering to art or to cultural labs. And, uh, and I kind of try to sum it up into two words. And I think it's a kind of path toward, towards a more sensible innovation. And uh, so I hope the path will explain more the two words and I try to define it more precisely at the end of the talk. So the story starts uh, at EPFL, which is uh, uh, an engineering school in Switzerland, in Lausanne. And uh, I studied there a quite new track in bioengineering, which uh, is now a kind of trendy uh, way to, build, to bind uh, engineering and biology mainly for biomedical applications. Um, and so I was there in 2008 in my second year and I had a lot of different courses in math, physics, chemistry, computer science, very theoretical stuff. And I was missing what I, w I had been sold, which is the creative part of the engineering job. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't really present in the courses. So I went to my study di director and asked him well, I thought engineering was a creative uh, job, so when are we going to get these creative processes taught? And he told me, well, uh, that's not really present in the main tracks courses, but you can get it if you go towards this project. So iGEM is a synthetic biology competition which takes place in MIT. And uh, synthetic biology is a new field very close to engineering, which tries to make artificial life from artificial materials. So it's a one step forward from artificial intelligence, which uses computer here. The idea is to use the very materials life uses. And uh, it's a very controversial topic, because iGEM stands for International, uh, International Genetically Engineered Machine. And, uh, but still, it was kind of creative, and I liked the approach of uh, getting some of the power of living systems for human applications. So I signed into this project. And uh, so here are the students from all over the world who attended this year. We were more than 80 teams. And our teams is somewhere on the left. And uh, our project um, was based on the famous bacteria E. coli, which was at that time the main living organisms we were working with at iGEM. And uh, basically, we wanted to transform E. coli into a emitter receiver system, so a chemical one. So we inserted genes inside the bacteria that would um, make it able to sense two different kinds of chemicals, and given the level of the chemicals, it would send itself one of the chemicals and some light, so some green or red light. <coughs> and then we would put them into a kind of grid with channels where they could communicate to each other and they would display patterns. So uh, we struggled quite a bit because we were all students. That's part of the iGEM spirit. It's to uh, teach undergraduate students how to lead projects uh, a bit on their own. Uh, we struggled a lot with lab techniques and uh, my feeling at the end of the, of the projects was mainly this one, which was <laughs> we took uh, very valuable uh, living organisms that is already fine-tuned, balanced, very intelligent in, in its own, and we just break them down to recover very part of its functions to make it just alive, and then insert a very rough transmitter emitter system that didn't really work because the living organisms couldn't really fit it properly. So I was kind of disturbed at the end of this project, and I thought maybe we should think the other way around, uh, starting not how engineering tools can influence biology, but how biological tools and biological systems can influence the way we do engineering. So next semester project, uh, two years later, we don't have that much projects in engineering. Um, I worked uh, on this platform, which is a robotic platform. Um, Roombots are pieces of furniture that uh, are made of single modules. You can see a module here. 
And um, these modules are equipped with motors, which make uh, we three motors that make it able to rotate over itself. And uh, you can, so that the, this, this module uh, produces pieces of furniture that can be uh, then assembled into, uh, <laughs> or self-assembled into pieces of furniture. But they can also, uh, they can also move <laughs> around the house. So uh, each of these servo motor has a microcontroller like we did with Mitch uh, this morning. And this microcontroller controls the, 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 the robot. And uh, we use um, two different kind of bio-inspiration in this process. First, the microcontrollers are seen as artificial neurons that get inputs and produces outputs like the neurons in our brains and nervous system does. And secondly, we would evolve the way they walk using artificial evolution, which is um, we would produce some initial robots and uh, with uh, some ways to walk, and then we would make them reproduce together and evolve and mutate towards more and more efficient uh, walks while applying a selection pressure on those that will have the more efficient walks. So my work within this project was to, um, to map the structures on animal structures. Because whenever we would start this artificial evolution from scratch, like random parameters, it would take ages and a lot of computer work to, to make them have a reasonable gait, which uh, in the end looked very much like the gait of living organisms. So we should, it would be, we thought it would be smarter to start with the gait from living organisms. And moreover, uh, this had uh, another uh, interesting aspect, is the robustness of these gates, which means that if the robot had a defect, we could also map the defect to a living organism, and uh, we know more or less how living organisms walk when they are injured in some way, and apply this kind of gate to the, to the robot too. So we were really taking inspiration of how living systems move, to apply it to our uh, robotic furniture. And that was my feeling at the end of the project. It was very, very complicated. I, I, I was trained as a bioengineer, so it was a lot of different kind of stuff, but robotics, we had only like two small electronics cores, and I have uh, the level of soldering we more or less learned this morning, so dealing with huge high-tech robotics was not my, my, um, my specialty, so I felt really, really lost, and in the end, um, the, my feeling was that it was not really useful uh, to produce this kind of furniture. They were funny, but we could have fun in a very simpler way, I thought. So, uh, with that in mind, I uh, took out of my library uh, a book, a book that was talking about bio-inspiration, but with a different topic, with a different aim, uh, the aim was to produce sustainable uh, innovations out of this uh, mindset of bio-inspiration. And uh, I had now uh, behind my back two projects uh, dealing with some creative processes, but within engineering, and I wanted to join the forces with people that do very good pictures of themselves, <laughs> but are, which, are, which are also called uh, industrial designers and that are one step further than the engineers into uh, the embodiment of uh, creative processes. And so we decided to work together on a product, a very unromantic product, which is a mass-produced kettle, uh, to make it more sustainable by making it bio-inspired. So, we started from this very uh, Chinese-based kettle, and we made a new one, starting from uh, an environmental analysis, because our main goal was to reduce its environmental impact. So what this environmental analysis told us is that it was the electricity during the use phase of the kettle that was the most uh, important impact, which means a very uh, user issue. The way we consume 
electrical energy to heat the water is the environmental problem even more than the production and the waste at the end of the, of the product life. So this was really interesting from a design point of view. And I'm not going to go into details of all the different tracks we followed, but I'll talk about two of them. First, we try, we try to improve the insulation of the kettle so that it wouldn't lose its heat too quickly. And we don't have to reheat all the time the water because this is one of the issues uh, we have as users. And we took inspiration from um, three living systems. Uh, first, uh, from the use of a given material, which is clay that is uh, quite insulating, especially if we in put some kind of porous structure inside. So clay was inspired from the uh, lipid layer we have in the surface of our uh, skins. And uh, the um, uh, porous structure was inspired from uh, the beak from Toucan, which is a um, microstructure to be very lightweight and still very robust and insulating in terms of temperature. So that was perfect to also carry the weight of the water. And then we used a third uh, aspect for insulation, which was the, the, um, the use of uh, anti-convection uh, coating, so which uh, avoids that air would um, circulate too much at the surface of the kettle and bring out heat. And we took inspiration from the polar bear who has a lot of hair, but uh, hollow hair to trap even more air than, um, than the regular hair. So that's, that, were, that were our three inspirations uh, that we took for the insulation. And then for the heat, also we decided to change the energy source of the kettle because electricity is one of the um, less intuitive we can use to produce heat actually because it is itself produced from heat. So we basically produce heat, lose a lot of energy by converting it to electricity and then reconverting it back to heat. So we thought how can we locally produce heat and we took advantage of the um, organic waste we have in the house and with a, a fermentation process we can produce methane which is natural gas. We can use this natural gas to heat the water so that's, what, that's the system we, we choose to implement. So it was a very nice project and I had a very much better insight into creative processes at the end of this collaboration with the industrial designer and we, worked, we, we wrote a, a book about it, a kind of diary all along the projects of how our methods kind of merged. But and this uh, project also was very well received by my school, even though at the beginning they were very doubtful of whether they should accept it or not, as it was not biomedical engineering. <laughs> also to show how sometimes these institutions can be trapped in some mindsets. But in the end, we got a prize at the school level, so we were very happy. But my feeling at the end of the project was to work in this kind of environment where we try to fit two uh, environments that are not really able to be fit together, uh, which is a kind of very urban uh, environment in which we try to, to fit the kettle, but an urban environment we, where we often do not have proper access to sun or to ground or this kind of essential resources, for, especially for bio-inspired processes. So, for instance, we could have made the kettle solar, but in the city, then it would have only worked for a few people and not for all the inhabitants of the city. So, I, I was trapped in this kind of uh, contradictions uh, between uh, the, the standard of living we want to have and what is already uh, available with the resources. And often the answer is to get to more high-tech systems, but then we have a lot of hidden costs with the high-tech systems. For instance, uh, we, were, we thought about smart materials, but all of them are made, are made of very uh, rare compounds that are themselves very energy intensive to be produced. So I felt kind of trapped into this uh, aspect and I wish that my future work were, was more involved with the lifestyle aspect also, and not only with the product for a universal generic uh, uh, booked up uh, with no time left consumer. So uh, this is when uh, Peter Hanap 
from a, a research lab in Sony contacted me because he was uh, writing a European research proposal for a project he had the idea uh, about. And this project is called Peer-to-Peer -peer Food Lab. And the, id the idea of this project is to propose a small uh, greenhouse, uh, the, the small greenhouse, uh, the schemes of a small greenhouse that you can build yourself, and uh, a culture, uh, um, a sensor box together with the small greenhouse that allows to uh, monitor certain variables, which are soil humidity and temperature, air humidity and temperature, amount of sunlight, and then to propose um, uh, some crops to grow uh, within the, the small greenhouse. It's a one meter square greenhouse, so the idea is that you can fit it in a lot of spaces in, the, in your, your urban environment. And, um, and the idea is then to connect all the users of these greenhouses with a web platform where they can exchange materials like seeds, compost, even their produce or cooked meal from their produce but also the knowledge about how they grow stuff and the data from the sensors. For instance, uh, you could uh, put your greenhouse and get some sensor da data, and then from the data collected by other users, you would be suggested a specific variety that works really well in, in, your, in your very environment. Uh, you could be uh, suggested the seeds by someone I want to exchange against other seeds and this kind of, uh, this kind of dynamics. So the idea was really to have a participatory processes close to citizen science system to help people uh, get started with even very small level uh, food production, but this is still a beginning. So I liked a lot uh, this, uh, this project, uh, but uh, and again, uh, we were not the only one to like it because we got awarded by a collaborative economy um, community in Paris, which is called WeShare. Uh, WeShare Fest is taking place again this year in May, and everyone who is interested by communities and participatory processes, I highly uh, encourage you to go and visit because it's a really wonderful atmosphere. So we are very happy to get the award for the peer-to-peer -peer system. But I was disturbed by one thing, and it was by the need, the need for this sensor system. Uh, it's kind of crucial in the, in the system because it brings objective data that allows you to really have, a, I would say, the, the most clear sight on a given situation, climatic situation for, uh, for growing your crops. But uh, I, got, uh, to, uh, I got to know that the, the electronics industry is uh, a social and environmental um, nightmare for many people around the planet. And I was kind of disturbed to be dependent on this very industry to make uh, some people, mostly in the occidental world, uh, grow some vegetables better. So, that's when I stumbled on the paper from a researcher in Austria, which is called Mihai Irimia Vladu. And uh, his work uh, consisted in building a transistor, a field effect transistor, which is the basic computing unit of a computer, out of uh, biosource materials you can find in uh, abundant uh, byproducts from the agricultural industry mainly. So we had. Uh, for instance, adenine and guanine are uh, DNA bases, so we can find them in any uh, biomass byproduct. Uh, beta carotene is present in the carrots, it's a color coloring agent. Lactose is a sugar you can find in milk. Glucose, you can find it also in many different living organisms. So he's really switching the mineral material base of electronics to a biological one. And his work was very inspiring but he was still making use of very high energy and uh, high scale machines that cost uh, several thousand to one million uh, euro each. So it's really industrial applications. And we had not that much budget. We were a small research lab and we wanted to still perform these processes. So we decided to go, um, yeah, I, step, I, I skipped a step, but we decided to go to uh, a hacker space, a biohacker space in Paris, which is called La Payasse. 
And this biohacker space um, provides basic uh, material, a bit like the open white lab here in, uh, in the VAR. And um, they collected this material from laboratories that were dumping it away because it was a bit too old, but it was still very fine for us. And we uh, tried to uh, get a, a bio-based semiconductor material out of, the, out of a culture of microorganisms. And this material is melanin. Melanin is also the pigment we have on our skin. And, um, and this uh, pigment is uh, a semiconductor, which means that its temperature, uh, its conductivity changes with temperature. So it's like the resistor we had this morning in the kit, but uh, the, the resistance varies with temperature, so we can measure temperature out of it. So we can basically build this uh, component, which is called a thermistor. It's uh, this. Uh, vari temperature variable uh, uh, resistor out of um, so build this material out of these organisms which is a yeast we can find in kefir which is a kind of yogurt so it's very uh, common a lot of people produce kefir at home uh, with grains you can exchange on internet so it's easy to find um, and you can grow it with ingredients you can find in the supermarkets, like uh, uh, yeast, uh, dried yeast, uh, agar agar you use to, to, to make cake, glucose you can take when you are a diabetic person, uh, some uh, uh, culturist bodybuilders uh, mix of proteins and all these kind of ingredients we can grow the, the, the yeast from. So we use very uh, low-tech appliances, so for sterilization we use the pressure cooker, for instance. And um, we uh, obtained, after a few weeks of growing this, uh, this yeast, an extract that contains melanin. Um, once again, we presented this work in the DARPA event known as Maker Faire, and uh, <laughs> we had a very nice uh, feedback from the visitors there, it was really uh, heartwarming and we even get uh, a, a slightly less uh, honoring uh, award than you get, but the Maker, Fair, uh, Maker of Merit award uh, that they hand on to projects they liked. Uh, but at the end of the project, again, my feeling, my feeling was kind of mixed. Uh, I had spent a lot of time in this project, uh, but I was uh, confronted to the two problematics linked to this concept, which is the concept of monoculture. Uh, when I show you this extract, uh, it contains melanin, but it's far from being only melanin. And to have this semiconducting effect we want for the component uh, to work, we need to have very pure melanin. Any impurity will massively drop this behavior. So uh, we needed to have some chemicals uh, to kind of clean up and degrade all the other materials and melanin and to get back to pure melanin. And uh, these chemicals are harsh chemicals, like acetone are chemicals we have to be um, careful about when we deal with them. And it was far away from all the rest of the philosophy of the project, which was to use readily available ingredients, biosourced ingredients, and move out of this material base that is toxic for the environment and for people. So I was kind of stuck with this. And uh, in my general life, I was stuck by the fact that I was working many hours a week on a single project and that there were many other things I wanted to develop on the side, but I hadn't time for this. I was working mostly with my brain and reading papers and doing a little bit of manipulation, but not that much with my body. And I, was, I felt that this over the long term wouldn't be sustainable. So that's when I accepted the offer from FOAM, uh, which is a cultural organization in Brussels, to be a resident for one year uh, at their place, and to take this year uh, as a transition year. Uh, the residency they offer to me is to stay there and develop whatever I want to develop in a bit out of the fuzziness of the real world, and take just time to develop uh, things I had in time until then. And um, the only thing I have to do for them is to report it, because FOAM's main interest uh, of research at the moment is to see how people can conduct change at their own level and 
how people can foresee the future using scenario planning, which is a methodology to kind of understand what are the trends at a given moment, and then to prototype these futures and see if the ideal future you see is really as ideal when you live it for real. So the, I'm kind of building myself this process for one year and they are following me and they want me to keep track of my feelings around this. So what I do now uh, as a daily life, uh, first I, uh, ex I uh, put out of the cupboard all my notebooks from several years ago where I wrote down, oh, I would like to do this, I would like to do that, but I don't have the time to do it, so I put everything on the wall and try to figure out what I wanted to get started with. And then I got started with very basic knowledge uh, that allows you to fulfill your own needs. Uh, I, I learned about uh, preserving vegetables with uh, fermentation, uh, producing kefir, but fruit kefir this time, not milk kefir. Um, uh, they offered me to use this two meter square balcony to grow as many vegetables as I can. So I started seedlings for this. Um, I got some wood and some other reclaimed materials from the street to build up uh, the planters for the balcony and to start also build up uh, solar stuff like solar ovens, uh, solar dryers to preserve the fruits again. So I'm very much into uh, very basic knowledge that uh, some of them have got by living in the countryside or by learning it from they, their parents. But I felt like I hadn't developed this enough and that it was at the very roots of my survival so that I should know how to do some of this stuff. And I'm also starting to build up a map. This is the very unreadable first version of how all these processes interconnect. So how you can use byproducts of the garden to burn in, in a rocket stove to cook the vegetables and then use the ash back in the garden to fertilize the garden or use it to produce soap that you can then use to wash your dishes and how all these DIY processes interconnect all together and how you can basically with minimal work and maximum uses of all the materials you have, how you can uh, set up uh, a more self-sufficient lifestyle uh, in a given environment. So that is my feeling right now. Uh, this is a map uh, I didn't do, but who uh, is uh, what we call a permaculture design map. Permaculture is mm, exactly the opposite of monoculture. It's a kind of agriculture that tries to map how living systems work when we let them on their own, and which is much more like a lot of diversity of plants, of different layers of plants all together, and a lot of this symbiotic and um, um, yeah, symbiotic and uh, synergetic uh, uh, relationships between the elements uh, set up. So permaculture tries to design such system and twist them towards the fulfilling of human needs. And uh, that's more what I feel like now. I feel like I'm kind of designing and experimenting in this field and I feel much better than with the monoculture one. So here is the present day, so we can now try to sum this up into one slide. So I started from iGEM and landed at foam. So iGEM, I could characterize it as very, uh, I don't know if it will work. It doesn't work. I'll show you the unanimated version. So I clarify it as very high tech research, uh, prospective innovation in the way that we don't know very much what it will look like, but uh, we kind of uh, have a lot of technical knowledge, new technical knowledge to develop to do this. And uh, some of people see high commercial potential and try to very much uh, invest money in this to see how we can go with this. On the other hand, what I do at phone now is very low tech and I really stick to it. Every time something gets too complicated, I think there, there must be a simpler solution. So I really stick to simple solution we can teach as Mitch told us this morning, really in one morning or something, someone else to do it and then you can be autonomous with it. In, we are more into innovative memory than prospective innovation in the way that it's often to get back to very old books of the pre-industrial age and see how people were doing at that time, see how it didn't work that well and why they then moved to industrial solutions and how we can blend them together to make something for the 21st century that is more fitted to the environment you want to live in. 
And finally, uh, it's often dealing with alternative economic models like uh, non-monetary exchange of services or of objects, also the, all the gift economy movement, which is just give whenever you have something to give and you will see that you will get back something whenever you need to. Um, and, um, and so these two words are drastically different, I think, and I feel way better in the second. The only issue is that uh, this is very well um, established research, very prom promising for many of the governmental agencies, and they are very willing to fund such research. This is considered as completely useless. My guess is because it has not a high commercial potential, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to get such research funded by uh, the main scientific research funds. However, um, I did get funded by the Flemish cultural program. So in my opinion, it's very interesting to see how kind of what is still technical research, but just with a broader cultural thinking, fits more into cultural programs rather than to a scientific research program, although they are the nature of this research is still very technical and utilitarian more than art usually is. So this is what I choose to call sensible innovation, which is not only innovation for the sake of bringing something new, and I wish Edwin was still here to discuss this, but uh, innovation in a way uh, to give a new answer to an existing problem, but by incorporating cultural thinking, broader cultural thinking, and what, how you see your life embedded in this, how you see your relationship with other embedded in this, rather than the very narrow uh, technical uh, research that is performed now that takes for granted what are just working, working hypotheses. Like we have to sell this, we have to produce this high scale, we have, and these are maybe part of why uh, some of these issues we are struggling with are going even worse. So I hope I can launch some debate with this and I thank you with for your attention. So this is a very site-related map, and as I will be in foam only one year, I'm not building a map uh, for foam because uh, then I will move away and it's more the foam people that should design the map. But um, that's the kind of thing I would design indeed for a site-specific project. What I try to do as a map now is more kind of a um, tool to assist design in a way that given the conditions of where you live and where you are, you can directly uh, find the solutions adapted to this particular location. So I'm not doing a site-specific map, but more a kind of review of the di diverse solutions and which may be fitted to which environments. To, to what degree? For example, when it comes to funding, funding these very necessary, actually really cool projects, could cannibalize uh, artistic funding in a sense. Uh, and I do understand your approach to it as culture in the sense of yeah. the best definition I ever heard of culture is whatever we use to communicate. I, I appreciate that, but I wonder if you're concerned at all, or if you could share some thoughts as to whether uh, if more and more funding in today's envision of somewhat limited resources technology, yeah. culture, rather than culture, that would have some effects. Yeah, so definitely, uh, I, I'm not that concerned about uh, possible cannibalism by um, this type of research onto uh, artistic funds, because I think that most of artistic institutions that get those funds are not interested to fund that kind of research. Foam is a very particular kind of artistic uh, um, artistic, a cultural organization, which says cultural rather than artistic, but um, who is interested in this kind of research, but I think there are very few and there is not so much danger. However, I deeply recommend that uh, the scientific and technological fund fund also this kind of work, that rather than we are put together on the same small funds with the artistic work. Because in my opinion, even though it uh, has a cultural and, uh, as you said, holistic thinking, it still is uh, technological development. 
so it's not artistic work I produce. I, I still want to have technology that are um, that is enjoyable to to use and that has some kind of very subjective and feeling aspects uh, out of this. But uh, for me, it's still technological research. So I wish it was funded by scientific and technological funds. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that it's done through Flemish cultural, and that's not so much your background. Uh, that's definitely definitely not my background, but that's the that's the network actually. I ended up there because I met FOM and because they are one of the few organizations that are interested in this kind of processes. But then I could have landed to any kind of similar organization somewhere else, and it would have been maybe the USA or or somewhere in Asia that would have funded it. It really depends on where you land. Yeah.